The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Chapter One. Tom, no answer. Tom, no answer. What's gone with that boy? I wonder. You, Tom, no answer. The old lady pulled her spectacles down and looked over them about the room. Then she put them up and looked out under them. She seldom or never looked through them for so small a thing as a boy. They were her state pair, the pride of her heart, and were built for style, not service. She could have seen through a pair of stove lids just as well. She looked perplexed for a moment and then said, not fiercely, but still loud enough for the furniture to hear. Well, I lay, if I get hold of you, I'll. She did not finish, for by this time she was bending down and punching under the bed with a broom, and so she needed breath to punctuate the punches with. She resurrected nothing but the cat. I never see the beat of that boy. She went to the open door and stood in it and looked out among the tomato vines and jimson weeds that constituted the garden. No, Tom. So she lifted up her voice at an angle calculated for distance and shouted, You, Tom! There was a slight noise behind her, and she turned just in time to seize a small boy by the slack of his roundabout and arrest his flight. There! I might have thought of that closet. What you been doing in there? Nothing. Nothing? Look at your hands and look at your mouth. What is that truck? I don't know, Aunt. Well, I know. It's jam. That's what it is. Forty times I've said, if you didn't let that jam alone, I'll skin you. Hand me that switch. The switch hovered in the air. The peril was desperate. My, look behind you, Aunt. The old lady whirled round and snatched her skirts out of danger. The lad fled on the instant, scrambled up the high board fence, and disappeared over it. His Aunt Polly stood surprised a moment and then broke into a gentle laugh. Hang that boy! Can't I never learn anything? Ain't he played me tricks enough like that for me to be looking out for him by this time? But old fools is the biggest fools there is. Can't learn an old dog new tricks, as the saying is. But my goodness, he never plays them alike two days. And how is a body to know what's coming? He peers to know just how long he can torment me before I get my dander up, and he knows if he can make out to put me off for a minute or make me laugh, it's all down again, and I can't hit him a lick. I ain't doing my duty by that boy, and that's the Lord's truth, goodness knows. Spare the rod and smile the child, as the good book says. I'm a-laying up sin and suffering for us both, I know. He's full of the old scratch, but laws o' me. He's my own dead sister's boy, poor thing, and I ain't got the heart to lash him somehow. Every time I let him off, my conscience does hurt me so, and every time I hit him, my old heart most breaks. Well, well, a man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble, as the scripture says, and I reckon it's so. He'll play hooky this evening. That's southwestern for afternoon. And I'll just be obliged to make him work tomorrow to punish him. It's mighty hard to make him work Saturdays when all the boys is having holiday, but he hates work more than he hates anything else, and I've got to do some of my duty by him, or I'll be the ruination of the child. Tom did play hooky, and he had a very good time. He got back home barely in season to help Jim, the small colored boy, saw next day's wood and split the kindling before supper. At least he was there in time to tell his adventures to Jim, while Jim did three-fourths of the work. Tom's younger brother, or rather half-brother, Sid, was already through with his part of the work, picking up chips, for he was a quiet boy and had no adventurous, troublesome ways. While Tom was eating his supper and stealing sugar as opportunity offered, Aunt Polly asked him questions that were full of guile and very deep, for she wanted to trap him into damaging revealments. Like many other simple-hearted souls, it was her pet vanity to believe she was endowed with a talent for dark and mysterious diplomacy, and she loved to contemplate her most transparent devices as marvels of low cunning. Said she, "'Tom, it was middling warm in school, wasn't it?' "'Yes'm. Powerful warm, wasn't it?' "'Yes'm. Didn't you want to go in a-swimming, Tom?' A bit of a scare shot through Tom, a touch of uncomfortable suspicion. He searched Aunt Polly's face, but it told him nothing. So he said, "'No'm. Well, not very much.' 
the old lady reached out her hand and felt Tom's shirt and said, "'But you ain't too warm now, though.' And it flattered her to reflect that she had discovered that the shirt was dry without anybody knowing that that was what she had in her mind. But in spite of her, Tom knew where the wind lay now, so he forestalled what might be the next move. "'Some of us pumped on our heads. Mine's damp yet, see?' Aunt Polly was vexed to think she had overlooked that bit of circumstantial evidence and missed a trick. Then she had a new inspiration. "'Tom, you didn't have to undo your shirt-collar where I sewed it to pump on your head, did you? Unbutton your jacket.' The trouble vanished out of Tom's face. He opened his jacket. His shirt-collar was securely sewed. "'Bother! Well, go along with you. I'd made sure you'd played hooky and been a-swimmin', but I forgive you, Tom. I reckon you're a kind of singed cat, as the saying is. Better'n you look, this time.' She was half sorry her sagacity had miscarried, and half glad that Tom had stumbled into obedient conduct for once. But Sidney said, "'Well, now if I didn't think you sewed his collar with white thread, but it's black. Why, I did sew it with white. Tom!' But Tom did not wait for the rest. As he went out the door, he said, "'Sitty, I'll lick you for that.' In a safe place, Tom examined two large needles, which were thrust into the lapels of his jacket, and had thread bound about them. One needle carried white thread, and the other black. He said, "'She'd never noticed if it hadn't been for Sid. Confound it! Sometimes she sews it with white, and sometimes she sews it with black. I wish to Jiminy she'd stick to one or t'other. I can't keep the run of them. But I bet I'll learn Sid for that. I'll learn him.' He was not the model boy of the village. He knew the model boy very well, though, and loathed him. Within two minutes or even less he had forgotten all his troubles. Not because his troubles were one whit less heavy and bitter to him than a man's are to a man, but because a new and powerful interest bore them down and drove them out of his mind for the time, just as men's misfortunes are forgotten in the excitement of new enterprises. This new interest was a valued novelty in whistling, which he had just acquired from a negro, and he was suffering to practice it undisturbed. It consisted in a peculiar bird-like turn, a sort of liquid warble, produced by touching the tongue to the roof of the mouth at short intervals in the midst of the music. The reader probably remembers how to do it, if he has ever been a boy. Diligence and attention soon gave him the knack of it, and he strode down the street with his mouth full of harmony and his soul full of gratitude. He felt much as an astronomer feels who has discovered a new planet. No doubt, as far as strong, deep, unalloyed pleasure is concerned, the advantage was with the boy, not the astronomer. The summer evenings were long. It was not dark yet. Presently Tom checked his whistle. A stranger was before him, a boy a shade larger than himself. A newcomer of any age or either sex was an impressive curiosity in the poor little shabby village of St. Petersburg. This boy was well-dressed, too, well-dressed on a weekday. This was simply astounding. His cap was a dainty thing, his close-buttoned blue cloth roundabout was new and natty, and so were his pantaloons. He had shoes on, and it was only Friday. He even wore a necktie, a bright bit of ribbon. He had a citified air about him that ate into Tom's vitals. The more Tom stared at the splendid marvel, the higher he turned up his nose at his finery, and the shabbier and shabbier his own outfit seemed to him to grow. Neither boy spoke. If one moved, the other moved, but only sidewise, in a circle. They kept face to face and eye to eye all the time. Finally, Tom said, "'I can lick you. I'd like to see you try it. Well, I can do it. No, you can't either. Yes, I can. No, you can't. I can. You can't. Can. Can't.' An uncomfortable pause. Then Tom said, "'What's your name? Tisn't any of your business, maybe.' "'Well, I allow I'll make it my business. Well, why don't you? If you say much, I will. Much, much, much. There, now.' "'Oh, you think you're mighty smart, don't you? "'I could lick you with one hand tied behind me if I wanted to.' "'Well, why don't you do it? "'You say you can do it. "'Well, I will, if you fool with me. "'Oh, yes, I've seen whole families in the same fix. "'Smarty, you think you're some now, don't you? "'Oh, you, what a hat! "'You can lump that hat if you don't like it. "'I dare you to knock it off, "'and anybody that'll take a dare will suck eggs. "'You're a liar!' 
You're another. You're a fighting liar and doesn't take it up. Ah, take a walk. Say, if you give me much more of your sass, I'll take and bounce a rock off in your head. Oh, of course you will. Well, I will. Well, why don't you do it, then? Why do you keep saying you will for? Why don't you do it? It's because you're afraid. I ain't afraid. You are. I ain't. You are. Another pause, and more eyeing and sidling around each other. Presently they were shoulder to shoulder. Tom said, Get away from me. Go away yourself. I won't. Well, I won't either. So they stood, each with a foot placed at an angle as a brace, and both shoving with might and main, and glowering at each other with hate. But neither could get an advantage. After struggling till both were hot and flushed, each relaxed his strain with watchful caution, and Tom said, "'You're a coward and a pup. I'll tell my big brother on you, and he can thrash you with his little finger, and I'll make him do it, too. What do I care for your big brother? I've got a brother that's bigger than he is, and what's more, he can throw him over that fence, too.' Both brothers were imaginary. "'That's a lie. Your saying so doesn't make it so.' Tom drew a line in the dust with his big toe and said, "'I dare you to step over that, and I'll lick you till you can't stand up. Anybody that'll take a dare will steal sheep.' The new boy stepped over promptly and said, "'Now you said you'd do it. Now let's see you do it. Don't you crowd me now. You better look out. Well, you said you'd do it. Why don't you do it? By Jingo, for two cents I will do it.' The new boy took two broad coppers out of his pocket and held them out with derision. Tom struck them to the ground. In an instant, both boys were rolling and tumbling in the dirt, gripped together like cats, and for the space of a minute they tugged and tore at each other's hair and clothes, punched and scratched each other's noses, and covered themselves with dust and glory. Presently the confusion took form, and through the fog of battle Tom appeared, seated astride the new boy, and pounding him with his fists. "'Holler enough!' said he. The boy only struggled to free himself. He was crying, mainly from rage. "'Holler enough!' and the pounding went on. At last the stranger got out a smothered, "'Nuff!' and Tom let him up and said, "'Now that'll learn you. Better look out who you're fooling with next time.' The new boy went off brushing the dust from his clothes, sobbing, snuffling, and occasionally looking back and shaking his head and threatening what he would do to Tom the next time he caught him out, to which Tom responded with jeers and started off in a high feather, and as soon as his back was turned the new boy snatched up a stone, threw it, and hit him between the shoulders, and then turned tail and ran like an antelope. Tom chased the traitor home, and thus found out where he lived. He then held a position at the gate for some time— daring the enemy to come outside, but the enemy only made faces at him through the window and declined. At last the enemy's mother appeared, and called Tom a bad, vicious, vulgar child, and ordered him away. So he went away, but he said he loud to lay for that boy. He got home pretty late that night, and when he climbed cautiously in at the window he uncovered an ambuscade in the person of his aunt." And when she saw the state his clothes were in, her resolution to turn his Saturday holiday into captivity at hard labor became adamantine in its firmness. CHAPTER Two, THE GLORIOUS WHITEWASHER Saturday morning was come, and all the summer world was bright and fresh and brimming with life. There was a song in every heart, and if the heart was young, the music issued at the lips— there was cheer in every face, and a spring in every step. The locust trees were in bloom, and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hill, beyond the village and above it, was green with vegetation, and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, reposeful, and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence, and all gladness left him, and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Thirty yards of board fence nine feet high, life to him seemed hollow, and existence but a burden. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank, repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence— and sat down on a tree-box discouraged. Jim came skipping out at the gate with a tin pail and singing Buffalo Gals. 
Bringing water from the town pump had always been hateful work in Tom's eyes before, but now it did not strike him so. He remembered that there was company at the pump. White, mulatto, and negro boys and girls were always there waiting their turns, resting, trading, playthings, quarreling, fighting, skylarking. And he remembered that although the pump was only a hundred and fifty yards off, Jim never got back with a bucket of water under an hour, and even then somebody generally had to go after him. Tom said, "'Say, Jim, I'll fetch the water if you'll whitewash some.' Jim shook his head and said, "'Can't, Marsh Tom. Old missus, she told me I got to go and get this water and stop fooling around with anybody. She say she spec Marsh Tom going to ask me to whitewash, and so she told me to go along and tend to my own business. She allowed she'd tend to the whitewashing. Oh, never mind what she said, Jim. That's the way she always talks. Give me the bucket. I, I won't be gone only a minute. She won't ever know.' "'Oh, I dazzled, Mars Tom. Old missus, she'd taken tar the head off'n me. Deed she would. "'She... she never licks anybody. Wax em over the head with her thimble, and who cares for that, I'd like to know. She talks awful, but talk don't hurt. Anyways, it don't if she don't cry. Jim, I'll give you a marvel. I'll give you a white alley.' Jim began to waver. "'White alley, Jim, and it's a bully taw.' "'My, that's a mighty gay marvel, I tell you. "'But Mars Tom, I's powerful afraid, old missus. "'And besides, if you will, I'll show you my sore toe.' "'Jim was only human. "'This attraction was too much for him. "'He put down his pail, took the white alley, "'and bent over the toe with absorbing interest "'while the bandage was being unwound. "'In another moment he was flying down the street "'with his pail and a tingling rear. "'Tom was whitewashing with vigor, "'and Aunt Polly was retiring from the field "'with a slipper in her hand and triumph in her eye. "'But Tom's energy did not last.' He began to think of the fun he had planned for this day, and his sorrows multiplied. Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions, and they would make a world of fun of him for having to work. The very thought of it burnt him like fire. He got out his worldly wealth and examined it. Bits of toys, marbles, and trash. Enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not half enough to buy so much as half an hour of pure freedom. So he returned his straightened means to his pocket and gave up the idea of trying to buy the boys. At this dark and hopeless moment, an inspiration burst upon him, nothing less than a great, magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. Ben Rogers hove in sight presently, the very boy of all boys, whose ridicule he had been dreading. Ben's gait was the hop, skip, and jump, proof enough that his heart was light and his anticipations high. He was eating an apple, and giving a long, melodious whoop at intervals, followed by a deep-toned ding-dong-dong, ding-dong-dong, for he was personating a steamboat. As he drew near, he slackened speed, took the middle of the road, leaned far over to starboard, and rounded too, ponderously and with laborious pomp and circumstance, for he was personating the big Missouri, and considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bells combined, so he had to imagine himself standing on his own hurricane deck giving the orders and executing them. "'Stop her, sir! Ding-a-ling-ling!' The headway ran almost out, and he drew up slowly towards the sidewalk. "'Ship up to back! Ting-a-ling-ling!' -ling. His arms straightened and stiffened down his sides. "'Set her back on the starboard! Ting-a-ling-a-ling! Chow! 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 Chow!' His right hand, meantime, described stately circles, for it was representing a forty-foot wheel. "'Let her go back on the larboard! Ting-a-ling-a-ling! -ling. Chow! Chow! Chow!' The left hand began to describe circles. "'Stop the starboard! Ting-a-ling-ling! -ling. Stop the larboard! Come ahead on the starboard! Stop her! Let her outside! Turn her over slow! Ting-a-ling! Chow, ch chow chow Get out that headline! Lively now! Come! Come out of there with your spring line! What are you about there? Take up a turn in that stump with the bright of it! Stand by that stage! Now let, let her go! Done with the engine, sir!' ting a ling ling sh -t -sh -t -sh -t. Trying the gauge cocks, Tom went on whitewashing, paid no attention to the steamboat. Ben stared a moment and then said, Hi-yee! You're up a stump, ain't you? 
no answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with the eye of an artist. Then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the result as before. Then ranged up alongside of him. Tom's mouth watered for the apple, but he stuck to his work. Ben said, "'Hello, old chap. You got to work, hey?' Tom wheeled suddenly and said, "'Why, it's you, Ben. I weren't noticing. Say, I'm going in a-swimming. I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would.' Tom contemplated the boy a bit and said, "'What do you call work? Why, ain't that work?' Tom resumed his whitewashing and answered carelessly, "'Well, maybe it is, and maybe it ain't. All I know is it suits Tom Sawyer.' "'Oh, come now, you don't mean to let on that like you like that.' The brush continued to move. "'Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day?' That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back to note the effect, added a touch here and there, criticized the effect again. Ben, watching every move and getting more and more interested, more and more absorbed, presently he said, "'Say, Tom, let me whitewash a little.' Tom considered, was about to consent, but he altered his mind. "'No, no, I reckon it wouldn't hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence, right here on the street, you know. But if it was the back fence, I wouldn't mind, and she wouldn't. Yes, she's awful particular about this fence. It's got to be done very careful.' I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, maybe two thousand, that can do it the way it's got to be done. No, is that so? Oh, come now, let me just try. Only just a little. I'd let you if you was me, Tom. Ben, I, I'd like to, honest Injun. But Aunt Polly, well, Jim wanted to do it, but she wouldn't let him. Sid wanted to do it, and she wouldn't let Sid. Now, don't you see how I'm fixed? If you was to tackle this fence and anything was to happen to it, oh shucks, I'll be just as careful. Now let me try. Say, I'll give you the core of my apple. Well, here. No, no, Ben, no, now don't. I, I'm afeard. I'll give you all of it. Tom gave up the brush with reluctance in his face, but alacrity in his heart. And while the late steamer Big Missouri worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by, dangled his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. There was no lack of material. Boys happened along every little while. They came to jeer, but remained to whitewash. By the time Ben was fagged out, Tom had traded the next chance to Billy Fisher for a kite in good repair. And when he played out, Johnny Miller bought in for a dead rat and a string to swing it with, and so on and so on, hour after hour. And when the middle of the afternoon came, from being a poor, poverty-stricken boy in the morning, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. He had, beside the things before mentioned, twelve marbles, part of a Jew's harp, a piece of blue bottle glass to look through, a spool cannon, a key that wouldn't unlock anything, a fragment of chalk, a glass stopper of a decanter, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, a kitten with only one eye, a brass doorknob, a dog collar, but no dog, the handle of a knife, four pieces of orange peel, and a dilapidated old window sash. He had had a nice, good, idle time all the while, plenty of company, and the fence had had three coats of whitewash on it. If he hadn't run out of whitewash, he would have bankrupted every boy in the village. Tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all. He had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it, namely that in order to make a man or boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. If he had been a great and wise philosopher, like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers, or performing on a treadmill, is work, while rolling ten-pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement." There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger coaches twenty or thirty miles on a daily line in the summer because the privilege costs them considerable money. 
but if they were offered wages for the service, that would turn it into work, and then they would resign. The boy mused a while over the substantial change which had taken place in his worldly circumstances, and then wended toward headquarters to report. Chapter 3 Busy at War and Love Tom presented himself before Aunt Polly, who was sitting by an open window in a pleasant rearward apartment, which was bedroom, breakfast room, dining room, and library combined. The balmy summer air, the restful quiet, the odor of the flowers, and the drowsing murmur of the bees had had their effect, and she was nodding over her knitting, for she had no company but the cat, and it was asleep in her lap. Her spectacles were propped up on her gray head for safety. She had thought that, of course, Tom had deserted long ago, and she wondered at seeing him place himself in her power again in this intrepid way. He said, "'Mayn't I go and play now, Aunt?' "'What, already? How much have you done?' "'It's all done, Aunt.' "'Tom, don't lie to me. I can't bear it.' "'I ain't, Aunt. It is all done.' Aunt Polly placed small trust in such evidence. She went out to see for herself, and she would have been content to find twenty per cent of Tom's statement true, when she found the entire fence whitewashed, and not only whitewashed, but elaborately coated and recoated, and even a streak added to the ground. Her astonishment was almost unspeakable. She said, "'Well, I never. There's no getting round it. You can work when you're a mind to, Tom.' And then she diluted the compliment by adding, "'But it's powerful seldom you're a mind to, I'm bound to say. "'Well, go along and play, but mind you get back some time in the week, or I'll tan you.' She was so overcome by the splendor of his achievement that she took him into the closet and selected a choice apple and delivered it to him, along with an improving lecture upon the added value and flavor a treat took to itself when it came without sin through virtuous effort.' And while she closed with a happy scriptural flourish, he hooked a doughnut. Then he skipped out and saw Sid just starting up the outside stairway that led to the back rooms on the second floor. Clods were handy, and the air was full of them in a twinkling. They raged around Sid like a hailstorm. And before Aunt Polly could collect her surprised faculties and sally to the rescue, six or seven clods had taken personal effect, and Tom was over the fence and gone. There was a gate, but as a general thing he was too crowded for time to make use of it. His soul was at peace now that he had settled with Sid for calling attention to his black thread and getting him into trouble. Tom skirted the block and came round into a muddy alley that led by the back of his aunt's cow-stable. He presently got safely beyond the reach of capture and punishment and hastened towards the public square of the village, where two military companies of boys had met for conflict, according to previous appointment. Tom was general of one of these armies, Joe Harper, a bosom friend, general of the other. These two great commanders did not condescend to fight in person, that being better suited to the still smaller fry, but sat together on an eminence and conducted the field operations by orders delivered through aide-de-camp. Tom's army won a great victory after a long and hard-fought battle. Then the dead were counted, prisoners exchanged, the terms of the next disagreement agreed upon, and the day for the necessary battle appointed after which the armies fell into line and marched away, and Tom turned homeward alone. As he was passing by the house where Jeff Thatcher lived, he saw a new girl in the garden, a lovely little blue-eyed creature with yellow hair plaited into two long tails, white summer frock, and embroidered pantalettes. The fresh-crowned hero fell without firing a shot. A certain Amy Lawrence vanished out of his heart and left not even a memory of herself behind. He had thought he loved her to distraction. He had regarded his passion as adoration, and, behold, it was only a poor little evanescent partiality. He had been months winning her. She had confessed hardly a week ago. He had been the happiest and the proudest boy in the world only seven short days, and here, in one instant of time, she had gone out of his heart like a casual stranger whose visit is done. 
He worshipped this new angel with furtive eye, till he saw that she had discovered him. Then he pretended he did not know she was present, and began to show off in all sorts of absurd boyish ways in order to win her admiration. He kept up this grotesque foolishness for some time, but by and by, while he was in the midst of some dangerous gymnastic performances, he glanced aside and saw that the little girl was wending her way toward the house. Tom came up to the fence and leaned on it, grieving and hoping she would tarry yet a while longer. She halted a moment on the steps and then moved toward the door. Tom heaved a great sigh as she put her foot on the threshold. But his face lit up right away, for she tossed a pansy over the fence a moment before she disappeared. The boy ran around and stopped within a foot or two of the flower, and then shaded his eyes with his hand and began to look down street as if he had discovered something of interest going on in that direction. Presently he picked up a straw and began trying to balance it on his nose, with his head tilted far back, and as he moved from side to side in his efforts he edged nearer and nearer toward the pansy. Finally his bare foot rested upon it, his pliant toes closed upon it, and he hopped away with a treasure and disappeared round the corner. But only for a minute, only while he could button the flower inside his jacket, next his heart, or next his stomach, possibly, for he was not much posted in anatomy, and not hypercritical anyway. He returned now, and hung about the fence till nightfall, showing off as before, but the girl never exhibited herself again, though Tom comforted himself a little with the hope that she had been near some window, meantime, and been aware of his attentions. Finally he rode home reluctantly, with his poor head full of visions. All through supper his spirits were so high that his aunt wondered what had got into the child— he took a good scolding about clodding Sid, and did not seem to mind it in the least. He tried to steal sugar under his aunt's very nose, and got his knuckles wrapped for it. He said, "'Aunt, you don't whack Sid when he takes it.' "'Well, Sid, don't torment a body the way you do. You'd be always into that sugar if I weren't watching you.' Presently she stepped into the kitchen, and Sid, happy in his immunity, reached for the sugar bowl, a sort of glorying over Tom which was well-nigh unbearable." but Sid's fingers slipped, and the bowl dropped and broke. Tom was in ecstasies, in such ecstasies that he even controlled his tongue and was silent. He said to himself that he would not speak a word, even when his aunt came in, but would sit perfectly still till she asked who did the mischief, and then he would tell, and there would be nothing so good in the world as to see that pet model catch it. He was so brimful of exultation that he could hardly hold himself when the old lady came back and stood above the wreck, discharging lightnings of wrath from over her spectacles. He said to himself, "'Now it's coming,' and the next instant he was sprawling on the floor. The potent palm was uplifted to strike again when Tom cried out, "'Hold on now! What are you belting me for? Sid broke it!' Aunt Polly paused, perplexed, and Tom looked for healing pity." but when she got her tongue again, she only said, "'Humph! Well, you didn't get a lick amiss, I reckon. You have been into some other audacious mischief when I wasn't around like enough.' Then her conscience reproached her, and she yearned to say something kind and loving, but she judged that this would be construed into a confession that she had been in the wrong, and discipline forbade that. So she kept silence, and went about her affairs with a troubled heart." Tom sulked in a corner and exalted his woes. He knew that in her heart his aunt was on her knees to him, and he was morosely gratified by the consciousness of it. He would hang out no signals. He would take notice of none. He knew that a yearning glance fell upon him now and then through a film of tears, but he refused recognition of it. He pictured himself lying sick unto death, and his aunt bending over him, beseeching one little forgiving word, but he would turn his face to the wall and die with that word unsaid. Ah, how would she feel then! And he pictured himself brought home from the river, dead, with his curls all wet and his sore heart at rest. How she would throw herself upon him, and how her tears would fall like rain, and her lips pray God to give her back her boy, and she would never, never abuse him any more. But he would lie there, cold and white, and make no sign, a poor little sufferer whose griefs were at an end. He so worked upon his feelings with the pathos of these dreams that he had to keep swallowing, he was so like to choke, 
and his eyes swam in a blur of water which overflowed when he winked, and ran down and trickled from the end of his nose. And such a luxury to him was this petting of his sorrows, that he could not bear to have any worldly cheeriness or any grating delight intrude upon it. It was too sacred for such contact. And so, presently, when his cousin Mary danced in, all alive with the joy of seeing home again after an age-long visit of one week to the country, he got up and moved in clouds and darkness out at one door as she brought song and sunshine in at the other. He wandered far from the accustomed haunts of boys and sought desolate places that were in harmony with his spirit. A log raft in the river invited him, and he seated himself on its outer edge and contemplated the dreary vastness of the stream, wishing the while that he could only be drowned all at once and unconsciously without undergoing the uncomfortable routine devised by nature. Then he thought of his flower. He got it out, rumpled and wilted, and it mightily increased his dismal felicity. He wondered if she would pity him if she knew. Would she cry and wish that she had a right to put her arms round his neck and comfort him? Or would she turn coldly away like all the hollow world? This picture brought such an agony of pleasurable suffering that he worked it over and over again in his mind and set it up in new and varied lights till he wore it threadbare. At last he rose up sighing and departed in the darkness. About half-past nine or ten o'clock he came along the deserted street to where the adored unknown lived. He paused a moment. No sound fell upon his listening ear. A candle was casting a dull glow upon the curtain of a second-story window. Was the sacred presence there? He climbed the fence, threaded his stealthy way through the plants, till he stood under that window. He looked up at it long and with emotion. Then he laid him down on the ground under it, disposing himself upon his back, with his hands clasped upon his breast and holding his poor wilted flower. And thus he would die, out in the cold world, with no shelter over his homeless head, no friendly hand to wipe the death damps from his brow no loving face to bend pityingly over him when the great agony came, and thus she would see him when she looked out upon the glad morning, and, oh, would she drop one little tear upon his poor lifeless form, would she heave one little sigh to see a bright young life so rudely blighted, so untimely cut down? The window went up, a maidservant's discordant voice profaned the holy calm, and a deluge of water drenched the prone martyr's remains." The strangling hero sprang up with a relieving snort. There was a whiz as of a missile in the air, mingled with a murmur of a curse, a sound as of shivering glass followed, and a small vague form went over the fence and shot away in the gloom. Not long after, as Tom, all undressed for bed, was surveying his drenched garments by the light of a tallow dip, Sid woke up. But if he had any dim idea of making any references to illusions, he thought better of it and held his peace, for there was danger in Tom's eye. Tom turned in without the added vexation of prayers, and Sid made mental note of the admission. Chapter 4 Showing Off in Sunday School the sun rose upon a tranquil world and beamed down upon the peaceful village like a benediction. Breakfast over, Aunt Polly had family worship. It began with a prayer built from the ground up of solid courses of scriptural quotations, welded together with a thin mortar of originality. And from the summit of this she delivered a grim chapter of the Mosaic Law, as from Sinai. Then Tom girded up his loins, so to speak, and went to work to get his verses— Sid had learned his lesson days before. Tom bent all his energies to the memorizing of five verses, and he chose part of the Sermon on the Mount, because he could find no verses that were shorter. At the end of half an hour Tom had a vague general idea of his lesson, but no more, for his mind was traversing the whole field of human thought, and his hands were busy with distracting recreations. Mary took his book to hear him recite, and he tried to find his way through the fog. Blessed are the, uh, uh, poor? Yes, poor. Blessed are the poor, uh, in spirit. In spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they, they, theirs. For theirs. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they, they, shh, for they, uh, S-H-A. 
for they, S-H, oh, I don't know what it is, shall. Oh, shall. For they shall, for they shall, um, uh, shall mourn. Uh, uh, blessed are they that shall, that they that, uh, they that shall mourn, for they shall, uh, shall what? Why, why don't you tell me, Mary? What do you want to be so mean for? Oh, Tom, you poor thick-headed thing. I'm not teasing you. I wouldn't do that. You must go and learn it again. Don't you be discouraged, Tom. You'll manage it, and if you do, I'll give you something ever so nice. There, now, that's a good boy. All right. What is it, Mary? Tell me what it is. Never you mind, Tom. You know if I say it's nice, it is nice. You bet you that's so, Mary. All right, I'll tackle it again. And he did tackle it again, and under the double pressure of curiosity and prospective gain, he did it with such spirit that he accomplished a shining success. Mary gave him a brand new Barlow knife worth twelve and a half cents, and the convulsion of delight that swept his system shook him to his foundations. True, the knife would not cut anything, but it was a sure enough Barlow, and there was inconceivable grandeur in that, though where the Western boys ever got the idea that such a weapon could possibly be counterfeited to its injury is an imposing mystery and will always remain so, perhaps. Tom contrived to scarify the cupboard with it and was arranging to begin on the bureau when he was called off to dress for Sunday school. Mary gave him a tin basin of water and a piece of soap, and he went outside the door and set the basin on a little bench there. Then he dipped the soap in the water and laid it down, turned up his sleeves, poured out the water on the ground gently, and then entered the kitchen and began to wipe his face diligently on the towel behind the door. But Mary removed the towel and said, "'Now ain't you ashamed, Tom. You mustn't be so bad. Water won't hurt you.' Tom was a trifle disconcerted. The basin was refilled, and this time he stood over it a little while, gathering resolution, took in a big breath, and began. When he entered the kitchen presently, with both eyes shut and groping for the towel with his hands, an honorable testimony of suds and water was dripping from his face. But when he emerged from the towel, he was not yet satisfactory, for the clean territory stopped short at his chin and his jaws like a mask. Below and beyond this line there was a dark expanse of unirrigated soil that spread downward in front and backward around his neck. Mary took him in hand, and when she was done with him, he was a man and a brother without distinction of color, and his saturated hair was neatly brushed and its short curls wrought into a dainty and symmetrical general effect. He privately smoothed out the curls with labor and difficulty and plastered his hair close down to his head, for he held curls to be effeminate, and his own filled his life with bitterness. Then Mary got out a suit of his clothing that had been used only on Sundays during two years. They were simply called his other clothes, and so by that we know the size of his wardrobe. The girl put him to rights after he had dressed himself. She buttoned his neat roundabout up to his chin, turned his vast shirt collar down over his shoulders, brushed him off, and crowned him with his speckled straw hat. He now looked exceedingly improved and uncomfortable. He was fully as uncomfortable as he looked, for there was a restraint about whole clothes and cleanliness that galled him. He hoped that Mary would forget his shoes, but the hope was blighted. She coated them thoroughly with tallow, as was the custom, and brought them out. He lost his temper and said he was always being made to do everything he didn't want to do. But Mary said persuasively, "'Please, Tom, that's a good boy.' So he got into the shoes, snarling. Mary was soon ready, and the three children set out for Sunday school, a place that Tom hated with his whole heart, but Sid and Mary were fond of. Sabbath school hours were from nine to half past ten, and then church service. Two of the children always remained for the sermon voluntarily, and the other always remained too, for stronger reasons. The church's high-backed, uncushioned pews would seat about three hundred persons. The edifice was but a small, plain affair, with a sort of pine-board tree-box on top of it for a steeple. At the door, Tom dropped back a step and accosted a Sunday-dressed comrade. "'Say, Billy, got a yaller ticket?' "'Yes.' "'Well, you take for her. Well, you give. Piece of licorice and a fish-hook. Let's see em.' Tom exhibited. 
they were satisfactory and the property changed hands. Then Tom traded a couple of white alleys for three red tickets and some small trifle or other for a couple of blue ones. He waylaid other boys as they came and went on buying tickets of various colors ten or fifteen minutes longer. He entered the church, now with a swarm of clean and noisy boys and girls, proceeded to his seat, and started a quarrel with the first boy that came handy. The teacher, a grave elderly man, interfered, then turned his back a moment, and Tom pulled a boy's hair in the next bench, and was absorbed in his book when the boy turned round, stuck a pin in another boy presently in order to hear him say, "'Ouch!' and got a new reprimand from his teacher." Tom's whole class were of a pattern, restless, noisy, and troublesome. When they came to recite their lessons, not one of them knew his verses perfectly, but had to be prompted all along. However, they worried through, and each got his reward in small blue tickets, each with a passage of scripture on it. Each blue ticket was pay for two verses of the recitation. Ten blue tickets equaled a red one, and could be exchanged for it. Ten red tickets equaled a yellow one. For ten yellow tickets, the superintendent gave a very plainly bound Bible, worth forty cents in those easy days, to the pupil. How many of my readers would have the industry and application to memorize two thousand verses even for a Doré Bible? And yet Mary had acquired two Bibles in this way. It was the patient work of two years, and a boy of German parentage had won four or five. He once recited three thousand verses without stopping, but the strain upon his mental faculties was too great, and he was little better than an idiot from that day forth. A grievous misfortune for the school, for on great occasions before company the superintendent, as Tom expressed it, had always made this boy come out and spread himself. Only the older pupils managed to keep their tickets and stick to their tedious work long enough to get a Bible, and so the delivery of one of these prizes was a rare and noteworthy circumstance. The successful pupil was so great and conspicuous for that day that on the spot every scholar's heart was fired with a fresh ambition that often lasted a couple of weeks. It is possible that Tom's mental stomach had never really hungered for one of those prizes, but unquestionably his entire being had for many a day longed for the glory and the eclat that came with it. In due course the superintendent stood up in front of the pulpit with a closed hymn-book in his hand and his forefinger inserted between its leaves and commanded attention. When a Sunday school superintendent makes his customary little speech, a hymn-book in the hand is as necessary as is the inevitable sheet of music in the hand of a singer who stands forward on the platform and sings a solo at a concert though why is a mystery, for neither the hymn-book nor the sheet of music is ever referred to by the sufferer. This superintendent was a slim creature of thirty-five, with a sandy goatee and short sandy hair. He wore a stiff standing collar whose upper edge almost reached his ears, and whose sharp points curved forward abreast the corners of his mouth, a fence that compelled a straight lookout ahead and a turning of the whole body when a side view was required. His chin was propped on a spreading cravat, which was as broad and as long as a banknote, and had fringed ends. His boot toes were turned sharply up, in the fashion of the day, like sleigh runners, an effect patiently and laboriously produced by the young men by sitting with their toes pressed against a wall for hours together. Mr. Walters was very earnest of mien, and very sincere and honest at heart and he held sacred things and places in such reverence, and so separated them from worldly matters, that unconsciously to himself his Sunday-school voice had acquired a peculiar intonation, which was wholly absent on weekdays. He began after this fashion. "'Now, children, I want you all to sit up just as straight and pretty as you can, and give me all your attention for a minute or two. There, that is it.' That is the way good little boys and girls should do. I see one little girl who is looking out of the window. I am afraid she thinks I am out there somewhere, perhaps up in one of the trees making a speech to the little birds. A plausive titter. I want to tell you how good it makes me feel to see so many bright, clean little faces assembled in a place like this, learning to do right and be good." and so forth and so on. It is not necessary to set down the rest of the oration. It was of a pattern which does not vary, and so it is familiar to us all. 
The latter third of the speech was marred by the resumption of fights and other recreations among certain of the bad boys, and by fidgetings and whisperings that extended far and wide, washing even to the bases of isolated and incorruptible rocks like Sid and Mary. But now every sound ceased suddenly, with the subsidence of Mr. Walter's voice, and the conclusion of the speech was received with a burst of silent gratitude. A good part of the whispering had been occasioned by an event which was more or less rare, the entrance of visitors. Lawyer Thatcher, accompanied by a very feeble and aged man, a fine, portly, middle-aged gentleman with iron-gray hair, and a dignified lady who was doubtless the latter's wife. The lady was leading a child. Tom had been restless and full of chafings and repinings, conscience-smitten, too. He could not meet Amy Lawrence's eye. He could not brook her loving gaze. But when he saw this small newcomer, his soul was all ablaze with bliss in a moment. The next moment he was showing off with all his might, cuffing boys, pulling hair, making faces, in a word, using every art that seemed likely to fascinate a girl and win her applause. His exaltations had but one alloy— the memory of his humiliation in this angel's garden, and that record in sand was fast washing out under the waves of happiness that were sweeping over it now. The visitors were given the highest seat of honor, and as soon as Mr. Walter's speech was finished, he introduced them to the school. The middle-aged man turned out to be a prodigious personage, no less a one than the county judge, altogether the most august creation these children had ever looked upon, and they wondered what kind of material he was made of, and they half wanted to hear him roar, and were half afraid he might, too. He was from Constantinople, twelve miles away, so he had traveled, and seen the world. These very eyes had looked upon the county courthouse, which was said to have a tin roof. The awe which these reflections inspired was attested by the impressive silences and the ranks of staring eyes. This was the great Judge Thatcher, brother of their own lawyer. Jeff Thatcher immediately went forward to be familiar with the great man and be envied by the school. It would have been music to his soul to hear the whisperings, "'Look at him, Jim. He's a-going up there. Say, look, he's a-going to shake hands with him. He is shaking hands with him. By jings, don't you wish you was Jeff?' Mr. Walters fell to showing off with all sorts of official bustlings and activities, giving orders and delivering judgments, discharging directions here, there, everywhere, that he could find a target. The librarian showed off, running hither and thither with his arms full of books, and making a deal of the splutter and fuss that insect authority delights in. The young lady teachers showed off, bending sweetly over pupils that were lately being boxed, lifting pretty warning fingers at bad little boys, and patting good ones lovingly. The young gentlemen teachers showed off with small scoldings and other little displays of authority, and fine attention to discipline, and most of the teachers of both sexes found business up at the library by the pulpit and it was business that frequently had to be done over again two or three times, with much seeming vexation. The little girls showed off in various ways, and the little boys showed off with such diligence that the air was thick with paper wads and the murmur of scuffling. And above it all, the great man sat and beamed a majestic judicial smile upon all the house, and warmed himself in the sun of his own grandeur, for he was showing off, too." There was only one thing wanting to make Mr. Walter's ecstasy complete, and that was a chance to deliver a Bible prize and exhibit a prodigy. Several pupils had a few yellow tickets, but none had enough, and he had been around among the star pupils inquiring. He would have given worlds now to have that German lad back again with a sound mind, and now at this moment, when hope was dead, Tom Sawyer came forward with nine yellow tickets, nine red tickets, and ten blue ones, and demanded a Bible. This was a thunderbolt out of a clear sky. Walters was not expecting an application from this source for the next ten years. But there was no getting around it. Here were the certified checks, and they were good for their face. 
Tom was therefore elevated to a place with a judge and the other elect, and the great news was announced from headquarters. It was the most stunning surprise of the decade, and so profound was the sensation that it lifted the new hero up to the judicial one's altitude, and the school had two marvels to gaze upon in place of one. The boys were all eaten up with envy, and those that suffered the bitterest pangs were those who perceived too late that they themselves had contributed to this hated splendor by trading tickets to Tom for the wealth he had amassed in selling whitewashing privileges. These despised themselves as being the dupes of a wily fraud a guileful snake in the grass. The prize was delivered to Tom with as much effusion as the superintendent could pump up under the circumstances, but it lacked somewhat of the true gush, for the poor fellow's instinct taught him that there was a mystery here that could not well bear the light, perhaps. It was simply preposterous that this boy had warehoused two thousand sheaves of scriptural wisdom on his premises. A dozen would strain his capacity without a doubt." Amy Lawrence was proud and glad, and she tried to make Tom see it in her face, but he wouldn't look. She wondered. Then she was just a grain troubled. Next, a dim suspicion came and went, came again. She watched. A furtive glance told her worlds, and then her heart broke, and she was jealous and angry, and the tears came, and she hated everybody. Tom, most of all, she thought. Tom was introduced to the judge, but his tongue was tied, his breath would hardly come, his heart quaked, partly because of the awful greatness of the man, but mainly because he was her parent. He would have liked to fall down and worship him if it were in the dark. The judge put his hand on Tom's head and called him a fine little man, and asked him what his name was. The boy stammered, gasped, and got it out. Tom. Oh, no, not Tom. It is... Thomas. "'Ah, that's it. I thought there was more to it, maybe. That's very well. But you've another one, I dare say, and you'll tell it to me, won't you?' "'Tell the gentleman your other name, Thomas,' said Walters, "'and say, sir, you mustn't forget your manners. Thomas Sawyer, sir. That's it. That's a good boy. Fine boy. Fine manly little fellow. Two thousand verses is a great many, very, very great many, and you never can be sorry for the trouble you took to learn them.' for knowledge is worth more than anything there is in the world. It's what makes great men and good men. You'll be a great man and a good man yourself some day, Thomas, and then you'll look back and say, it's all owing to the precious Sunday school privileges of my boyhood. It's all owing to my dear teachers that taught me to learn. It's all owing to the good superintendent who encouraged me and watched over me and gave me a beautiful Bible." a splendid, elegant Bible, to keep, and have it all for my own, always. It's all owing to right bringing up. That is what you will say, Thomas, and you wouldn't take any money for those two thousand verses. No, indeed, you wouldn't. And now you wouldn't mind telling me and this lady some of the things you've learned. No, I, I know you wouldn't, for we are proud of little boys that learn. Now, no doubt you know the names of all the twelve disciples. Won't you tell us the names of the first two that were appointed?' Tom was tugging at a buttonhole and looking sheepish. He blushed now, and his eyes fell. Mr. Walter's heart sank within him. He said to himself, "'It is not possible that the boy can answer the simplest question. Why did the judge ask him?' Yet he felt obliged to speak up and say, "'Answer the gentleman, Thomas. Don't be afraid.' Tom still hung fire. "'Now I know you'll tell me,' said the lady." The names of the first two disciples were David and Goliath. Let us draw the curtain of charity over the rest of the scene.